Well now, Booktube, um, it's Rose and I'm here to do a wrap up for September. Now it's actually not quite the end of September, but I have already read 26 books this month, plus a couple of other bits and pieces. So um, anything else that I do fit in may well be a bit of a preemptive strike on, on some Victober reading. Why so many, Rose? Um, that's about twice as much as I'd usually read. Well, it's actually been shorty September, so lots of those have been really short books. And I've, I've happily been on holiday for two weeks, but quite a lazy sort of holiday that allowed for lots and lots of reading. So there we go. Now, that's far too many books to do kind of real reviews of any number of them, isn't it? So I'm going to flip through quite a number in a kind of more of a tops and flops style, I suppose. And I read one play because it was September in September, wasn't it? And I read a Midsummer Night's Dream with Tilly and we did a discussion drama video and it was, of course, sublime because, you know, it's Midsummer Night's Dream. So, you know. I only read one collection of poetry, um, or full collection of poetry um, this month. And, but fortunately, that was an absolute stunner. And it's um, all the names given by Raymond Antropus. And if you're a po reader of poetry, I, I just have to say that I think Antropus is one of our best young British poets working at the moment. This is his second full collection and just as, you know, just as good as the first, I thought. I read six non-fiction books. And one of those was really a disappointment to me. And that was um, Summer Before Dark by Volker um, Weidemann. Subject matter was as interesting as I hoped, but it really irritates me when non-fiction writers writing, um, you know, biography, you know, writing about other people, attribute thoughts and feelings to them and then don't give us any kind of source or references or, you know, no footnotes, no nothing to kind of back that up. I can't, can't handle it. So... That one was a thumbs down. The others, though, were really interesting. Now, um, one was a memoir. Um, two were memoirs, but this is the first memoir. When Mountains Weep by Garby Mustafa. And Mustafa is uh, Iraqi, of um, who's Kurdish, and... Um, He's now Professor of English at the University of Dohuk, but he spent a big chunk of his um, life in sort of in exile from Iraq. And it's, it's the story of his boyhood, growing up Kurdish in Iraq and then having to flee Iraq at, at, at one stage. Um, it, if you know anything about the Kurds, you will know that they are one of those sort of almost like groups of people that 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 maybe ought to have a country but don't you know that that kind of lost out when um you know the british and the french kind of sliced up um that part of of the middle east in a relatively arbitrary fashion um to suit our political ends at the time very tough read quite harrowing but really interesting um yeah i certainly sort of recommend it if you're interested in in, in kurdistan and iraq under um, saddam hussein i read two books which uh, which could be described i guess as, as as slave narratives um one of those is barracoon by zora neale hurston and um it's a book that was based on interviews that she did at the very end of the 1920s with um, Kucho Lewis or Oluwalo Kusula, his was his original name, um, who was, as far as she knew, the, the last surviving person in the United States who had been trafficked from Africa, from the west coast of Africa, um, what is now Benin in his case, um, and then enslaved in the US. He arrived in 1960, so that was uh, 1860, 1860, so that was after um, this, the US slave trade had been um, uh, forbidden, you know, uh, uh, but 
it did still happen and this was the last ship to 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 come and um what an interesting book for a bit of balance i also read i thought i should also read a a a, a, a british um version i suppose you know because you know it's not like you know the americans had no um uh you know monopoly on 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 cruelty and slavery um the british absolutely had their part so i read um the history of mary prince which again is um not literally an autobiography it you know it's it's it, she was interviewed and gave her account and it was it was recorded and you know it, it, some of it is kind of more or less in her own words and some of it is sort of a bit sort of tidied up and interpreted that was published in 1831 and it was basically um, the intention of the book was to win the um, support of the British public in opposing um, slavery in the British Empire. So you know, the slave trade had been um, uh, banned but slavery still very much existed in, in the British British possessions and including in the Caribbean and 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 so in a sense it was a, a, a book of of with a, a, a propaganda purpose um, and and quite successful but it actually caused two libel actions you know because the people were so annoyed by it. What is interesting about reading that alongside reading Barracoon is that Barracoon in contrast um, uh, Hurston couldn't get it published as a book. I mean, it came out. Uh, she wrote a sort of a, a, a academic journal article, I think. But 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 and why not? Why not? Because it appears people almost didn't want that story kind of spread about too widely, because it could be used perhaps for for propaganda purposes in, in another way. Um, let me explain that better. It, 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 Kucho or, 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 or Lale um, uh, explains how he, how, how, you know, other people in Benin, um, you know, captured him and traded him to the Americans. And, you know, I suppose that story, although, you know, no, was known to be true, too much about the story could, or it could almost be used to sort of minimise um, the um, white, slavers um culpability so only relatively recently um it's come out as a book now the other non-fiction book i read this month was prompted by the very sad news that um hilary mantel um has died at the you know, relatively young age of 70 and 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 quite unexpectedly and that nudged me to read her memoir giving up the ghost which she published in 2003 so before she sort of hit the absolute heights of her success with wolf hall and so on but um it was particularly poignant i suppose to read it at the time of her death you know within days of her death she she had quite a tough early life tough childhood and then horrendous struggles with ill health that wasn't properly diagnosed and you know, her success as a writer was hard won later in life. Um, and yeah, this memoir really brought that home to me. It also reminded me what a brilliant prose stylist Mantel is, was. Yeah. Another British women writer who came to literary success later in life, even later, older, you know, than Mantel was, and who also is the most brilliant um, pro stylist, I would say, is Penelope Fitzgerald. And it's Booker Season. And it being Booker Season reminded me that I never actually read her book that won the Booker Prize in 1979, Offshore. She was 63 by then. So, you know, not as old as Alan Garner will be if he wins it, but, you know, very much a mature writer. It was only her third novel. I just loved it. Um, do read it. Yeah, ignore the current list and, and, and read Penelope Fitzgerald instead. Well, having said that, I actually read three books this month which were on the book a long list, two of which made it through to the short list. 
one of those there's no point in me saying anything about because it's um, small things like these by Claire Keegan and you know all the world and her auntie have talked about that and many many people enthusing about it and I'm certainly on the enthusing side I I'm keen to read more by Keegan um, I think the first thing that I read by her next will be Foster um, because that was really warmly recommended by uh, Jacqueline McMenamin, who's one of one of Butchie's super commenters. The other one that, well, the other two that I read are more kind of Marmite books, I think. Now, I just happen to be a big Marmite eater, a big Marmite fan, and I love both these books. One of them is Treacle Walker by Alan Garner. It's a book that is steeped in the folklore and dialect of the north of England, and particularly Cheshire. If you haven't read Garner before, um, if you enjoyed Lanny by Max Porter, you might, you know, that this might appeal to you. I think this one's an even better book than that for me. Um, less, I don't know, less whimsical maybe, a bit tougher. I don't know. Anyway, big thumbs up. The other one which didn't make it to the shortlist but I loved was Case Study by Graham McRae Burnett. Now, this is a book that is, I found tremendously funny and enormously, outrageously clever. It's a book to read if you like not knowing where you are with a book as you read it, you know, if you're happy to be in a state of kind of befuddlement or, or feeling like oh that oh no oh well maybe that wasn't oh dear, who this who who's you know if you're if you're comfortable with that and you like um a bit of fun and some uh ideas and yeah a kind of a, a, a russian doll style for a book read that one well now where are we what shall i talk about next oh i read Two books this month that were by fellow booktubers, which is always, you know, a bit of fun, a bit of a treat, isn't it? One of those was Jenu. Um, now, Jenu is a graphic novel or comic, as as um, as you might say, and it's written by like, a little group of people, one of which was Tommaso Tedesco, or as we know him on booktube, Tom Ellie Books. Now, and he um, kindly sort of... Um, gave me a copy of, of, of this book, for which huge thanks, Tom. It's not my usual sort of graphic novel to read in that it's um, definitely at the science fiction end of um, uh, graphic fiction or comics. It draws on, or kind of, uh, I suppose, the traditions of the 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 sci-fi superhero-y dystopian sort of graphic fiction you know it's got an evil genius at, at the heart of it um but it's a bit more um it's like the adult the adult end of that the sophisticated um thoughtful um imaginative um end of of that sort of thing i really liked the um little homage to um to the visual arts in in the artwork for the book and particularly surrealism but others as well um that you know appealed to me it's um it's a tremendous um book it's uh now available in an omnibus edition uh, and read it if you if you want to discover another side to our tom um a little bit different from dante although i think he would claim that some of the kind of ideas he's absorbed from reading things like the Divine Comedy are there in, in genuine, and I think that's true. Now, the other booktuber novel that I that I read this month was um, exactly the kind of novel that you would expect this person would write, okay? Because it's by Pavio of um, the channel, whose channels pay attention, any of you who have watched Pay's videos you will be unsurprised to hear that this book is clever, um, imaginative, entertaining, um, and odd, and 
full of ideas, a whole load of which you're probably not really sure if you grasp. <laughs> but you know, that is what you'd expect from Pei, isn't it? And, and very enjoyable it is too. Now, I'm not sure how he intends the title to be pronounced, but I'm going to call it uh, the Perlin Decline. It's set in La Rochelle uh, on the west coast of France. Um, the, the setup is uh, that this uh, young person, Simon, Finnish, um, wakes in hospital from a coma with memory loss and goes back to her apartment and finds it is full of rocks. And uh, from this, the story ensues. Hmm, an apartment full of rocks. Perhaps not a surprise from someone who we know from his videos lives in an apartment full of plastic ducks. Um, it, you won't discover a different side of Pei from reading this book, but you will, will yes, if you if you like. Um, I suppose, as, as with um, uh, case study, if you don't mind being a bit befuddled as you're reading something, and um, then one, definitely one to read. Easily available as an ebook, by the way. So, what next? What next? Well, Shorty September usefully nudged me to read two books that have been on my TBR for quite a while um, and were nice and short. So, um, one of those was, is a recent um, British novella uh, assembly by Natasha Brown, and the other was more of a sort of classic, modern classic from America, and that was Corrigidora by Gail Jones. They are both really good books that explore a kind of a, um, a kind of black woman's experience in very different settings. Uh, I enjoyed them both, I admired them both, but they neither of them kind of blew me away, perhaps in the way that I was anticipating. Um, I think, you know, it's that thing where you've read other people's opinions and you, your, your expectations are very high and then things are sort of just, just good and not amazing. Yeah, don't let that put you off, I think. Neither of them were anywhere near as disappointing as a new release, relatively new release that I read, which was Still Life by Sarah Winman. What a stodgy book that was. I mean, nice in many ways and with some, you know, lovely bits, but oh God, it should have been about, I don't know, half the length and it would have been a lot better. That, however, was not my lowest rated book of the month. That honour <laughs> falls to um, Petra Nil by a uh, Belgian author, Amelie Nothomb, uh, translated by Alison Anderson. Witty book, but I thought it was just completely vacuous. Now, a book that was the absolute opposite of vacuous um, that I read this month was um, The Women of Tijuca Cupapo by um, Marielena Felinto, um, 1982 novel. She's from Brazil, um, translated by Arini Matthews. Now, if you watch this channel regularly, you will know I'm a bit obsessed with the Brazilian author Clarice Lispector. And I was interested to read a book by Felinto, who's a slightly um, more recent sort of big name in, um, in Brazilian writing. Because Felinto comes from a very different kind of background to the spectre, or, or indeed um, like the other perhaps um, Brazilian writers that I might have, might have read in that. She's from a working class background from the northeast of Brazil. She's um, sort of a sort of mixed heritage, you know, black, but also um, indigenous Brazilian. She, she's a, they're very much a feminist writer. Um, and uh, yeah, this book was a book full of rage, I would say. Um, stylistically really interesting. She's someone who lo obviously loves language and kind of plays with language and the translator did a really good job of, of capturing that, I think. Um, it, it's really confirmed my interest in reading more Brazilian literature, both old and new. Um, a, a recommendation. Um, New country for me this month, you know, I always try each month to read a book by an author from a country, but I've never read a book from that country before. And and this this month's one was um, The Lieutenant of Cuta by a writer from Mali, 
um, uh, Massa Macantiabate. Now, I will do a scaly dandin video about that at some point, possibly not till after Victoria, so I'll say nothing more about that one for now. I read two books this month that were banned books because of um, Banned Books Week. You know, that was the extra nudge to read those, I suppose. And um, one of those was Women Without Men by uh, Sharnush Pasipur, translated by uh, Faridun Farok. This is a book from Iran, um, and it's a book about the lives of Iranian women, I guess. It's, or to use a slightly unsatisfactory term, but it will help you understand what sort of book it is, I would describe it as magical realist. Um, you know, there is a woman in this who becomes a tree. Yeah. Um, she wrote it in 1989 and was actually imprisoned as a result. It's a, a, it's a, it's a wonderful small book. Um, yeah, again, a recommendation. The, the other um, one that I read for Band Books Week, I've done a, a, a video about, so I won't say much about it, but it was Smile As They Bow by um, Nunu Yi. And that's a book that explores a particular aspect of, 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 of gay life in Burma. And um, interestingly, I also read two books that explore something about kind of, I don't know, the challenges of being queer in two different African countries. Uh, one of those was um, La Bastada by Trifonia Abono, translated by Laurence um, Schimmel. This is, how should I say, it's a really valuable book, a special and important book in a sense, in that um, it's, it's the only book in available for Anglophone readers to have um, a voice of um, a woman from Equatorial Guinea, let alone a voice of a, of a, of a, of a queer woman. It's well worth reading, but I have to say up front, it is, it's relatively, I don't know, clumsy, I suppose, in terms of the actual writing style. But um, that's not a reason perhaps not to, it's only short, and the, the insight it gives is tremendous. A better book um, was um, a book that I read particularly because of the uh, Kenyan readathon and because I'd seen um, Bill, who's a Kenyan author, talk about this book on one of Sean's um, bite-sized book chats and that book is um, And This Is How to Stay Alive um, by, um, now let's get her, her name, Shingai Jerry Kagunda. Not a writer I knew before, she, but though it's not her first book, she's, but she's a young Kenyan woman writer um, it's a really fresh voice, really, it's a really sparky book, um, and with an element of time travel in it. Um, I enjoyed it, so did Sean, you can see, uh, I'll link to the video where he talks about it a bit more because um, I'm not going to say more about it. Now, I read La Bastada for the LGBTQ Books in Translation kind of read-along group, um, and it's actually one of the um, October, November, December choices, but I was getting it in early because October is going to be all about Victober for me. So, but the book that I read in September that was, you know, due to be read in September was Kiss of the Spider Woman by Man Manuel Puig, who's an Argentinian writer. It's a really well known book because it was made into um, a very successful film. It's. Um, it's a book that took a while to win me over, but by the end, I, 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 I really loved it and I was very glad to have read it. Um, I will say that the um, that regional group, really active on Discord, it's carrying on into um, to the end of the year and then into 2023. Do get involved if you're at all interested in books that kind of um, might give you a um, different perspectives um, from around the world and uh, about sort of LG from LGBTQ authors. Um, as usual, I have kept one of my absolute favourite books of the month for last. 
That's also in part, I think, because it's a book that's quite hard to kind of categorise or, or link to anything else that I've read this month. Um, but that book is Cold Enough for Snow by Jessica Au. Now, she's Australian, but of Chinese sort of heritage. It's a quiet book. It, it follows a mother and a daughter on a, on a holiday together in Japan. We hear it from the daughter's perspective, but we observe the, her and her mother and their relationship. It, 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 we see little, you know, nothing happens really. You know, they, they just go on this holiday and we hear about the different places they go and the different things that they do. I thought it was exquisite, actually. Um, and I found it unexpectedly really moving. Um, it was one of those rare books that, you know, brought an actual little tear to my eye, almost without the author, I think, me particularly intending it to. I think it resonated for me because it reminded me of times when I travelled with my mother when she was still alive and how that the way we travelled together changed as she grew older, which is kind of what you see in this book. Anyway, that was my September reading. Um, a great month. I kind of steamed through a load of, of, of shorter novels that I've been and non-fiction that have been hanging around for a while on my Kindle or on my bookshelves. So a very special thank you to the Shorty September hosts, um, Bert and Sean and Heather. And uh, I hope you had a brilliant September too.